Hey, good morning. And welcome to what is our new attempt at hybrid uh, conferencing, both in person and online. You're seeing it in real time here at South by Southwest EDU. So exciting. Um, okay, I'm Greg Rosenbaum. I'm the Senior Director for South by Southwest EDU, and I am super excited to be introducing the first session of 2022, um, the first featured session, I should say. The impact of climate change on our lives, our communities, and our world is present every day. But what we can do as a learning community with robust infrastructure and education to address the needs of our climate is paramount. Today we'll hear from leaders on their vision for the future and the impact they have uh, in advancing climate change action in schools. Laura Shifter the, leads the K-12 Climate Action Initiative at the Aspen Institute will be moderating today's discussion with a multi-generational panel, including student voice organizer, organizing director, Maya Green, American Federation of Teachers President, Randy Weingarten, and former US Secretary of Education and President of the Education Trust, gubernatorial candidate, John King. Quick reminder, during the Q&A section, you go to your app, click on the session, click on engage, and you can ask questions there, both for our in-person audience and for our online audience. Please join me in welcoming the panel. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we're really excited to have this panel here and we're just going to start things off with a quick video um, to talk to you all about the importance of this work. As an educator and as the father of two daughters, I worry a lot about the world that we are leaving our young people. It is a world deeply damaged by our reliance on fossil fuels. And the question is, how do we move forward from here? I can't imagine a future for my daughter where she doesn't have access or opportunities um, to connect with the land the same way I did because of climate change. I realize that if I want my daughters to be able to have the choice uh, to live in South Florida 30, 40, 50 years from now, we're going to have to take action. When I served as mayor of New Orleans, I witnessed the impact of climate change directly. It came with the increasing intensity of hurricanes and floods. When I see the climate crisis, I see it putting so much pressure and weight on people's ability to just like exist as they are. We know that the impact on the environment has a real significant uh, impact on children's ability to learn. This is the moment where we have to make a decisive commitment to create the cleaner future that can stave off the worst impacts of climate change. Inequity is the challenge of our lifetime. And the only way that we're gonna overcome these inequities in our society is through the future leaders that we have in schools. I am very concerned about climate change. And I recognize that schools offer us a huge opportunity the uh, education establishment is a very large industry, and there's a lot that can be done. In the places I'm from, quality climate education could make such a difference in people's lives, and I would really love to make that happen in my lifetime. Public schools can prepare and have to prepare our kids for the high-wage, high-skilled jobs in a new clean economy. Our students are our future. The leaders of tomorrow are being educated in our classrooms today. Why would we not want them involved in the climate dialogue right now? Great, so thank you all again for joining us here today. Um, my name is Laura Shifter. I'm a senior fellow uh, with the Aspen Institute um, as the staff lead on K-12 Climate Action, and I'm also a lecturer on education at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. And I'm thrilled to be here with um, three amazing education leaders to talk more about what our education sector can do on climate change. So just to let you all know, one thing that we uh, will be doing today, just some housekeeping, is we will be taking questions through the Slido feature. Um, if you do want to ask a question, you can go to the South by Southwest EDU Go app and use the uh, press engage and use the Q&A feature. 
So I am thrilled to be here with Maya Green, who is the organizing director for Student Voice and a second year student at Stanford University. Yay. Former Education Secretary John King, who was Education Secretary for the Obama Administration and now President of the Education Trust. And Randy Weingarten, who's President of the American Federation of Teachers. And uh, both John and Randy have uh, been a part of K-12 Climate Action. And Maya uh, presented to the commission a little while ago. So just to get things going, um, climate change is a personal issue for many. I know I experienced my own climate moment when a UN report came out and I was looking at my children and thinking I had to do something to ensure that they would have a good future. And that's what brought me to this work. So I'd love to take a minute and ask each of you to share a little bit about what motivates you to think about the intersection with climate change. So we'll start with Maya and then go to Secretary King and then Randy. Yes, thank you, Laura. Um, well, I can definitely think back to a specific moment when I learned that climate change was a thing. Um, I was at the beach with my uncle, who's an engineer, and he was kind of describing the greenhouse effect to me in ways that I could understand as a seven-year-old. Um, and he was explaining that, you know, the kind of accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could eventually make the sea bubbly, like Coca-Cola. Um, which is obviously a gross oversimplification of the issue, but I remember <laughs> thinking then, like, wow, like this is this is this is something that could transform the world, like kind of as I know it as a child. Um, so I remember that as the moment I learned about climate change. But then, kind of as I got older and got into high school, I remember also just experiencing climate change. Um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and so the frequency with which my family had to evacuate for hurricanes just kind of increased dramatically, like even over my lifetime. And so seeing, I guess, the impacts of climate change on my own community, seeing how even a long rainstorm could make the streets of Charleston flood and knowing that, you know, if we continue as things are, uh, it was only going to get worse, um, really just impressed on, upon me, like, how much of an existential issue climate change is. Um, and then even as I was feeling this increased urgency about the issue, um, I felt that when I went to school every day, um, it wasn't really something that was being discussed or acknowledged in any meaningful way or kind of explored in what we were learning about. And so I think as I grew also increasingly interested in education, it was clear to me that schools could be doing so much more than they are right now to kind of address what many of my generation feel like is like the primary issue for our futures. Yeah, I think for me, it, it's very much bound up with being a father and thinking about my daughters and their future, their 15 and 18, and knowing that so many of their experiences in life will now be shaped by the consequences of climate change. And they have been very forceful in making the point that too often older folks will say to young people, well, you know, this is your problem. You're going to have to solve it. You're going to have to make the future better. <laughs> and their response is, y'all are still here. Well, you're supposed to be part of the solution. This can't be something we put on young people to solve. We need today's leaders, whether it's in the political sector, the business sector, the education sector, to step up to this challenge and acknowledge that we are in a real climate emergency. And, and they're right. And so I take that responsibility seriously. And I think for all of us on the commission, what we've seen is that there's so much that schools could be doing from an infrastructure standpoint and an educational standpoint. And there are people doing it all over the country. We just haven't taken that to scale. We have these pockets of excellence that we haven't taken to scale. And we have an opportunity. And this conversation is very much a part of that. So I'm honored to be a part of it. Cross Bronx Expressway. Why do I say that? You think about the asthma in the kids in the Bronx. 
you think about the fact how much pollutants are used in that one road, trucks, cars, many trucks, many more trucks. And this is the 21st century. We know that kids who are asthmatic get hurt. Why are we not solving these things? Hurricane Maria, the fires, Hurricane Sandy. I had two of uh, friends' kids die in Hurricane Sandy. This is a personal, this is personal for all of us, and there is a way of solving. But we talk about it all the time, and we don't make it a national priority, which is why I'm so grateful that Aspen actually figured out how to make it a non-ideological major priority for civil society, starting with education. Great, thank you all. Um, Secretary King, you are a co-chair of K-12 Climate Action, um, which we just released a report this past fall around what the education sector can do to take climate action. Um, can you share with us a little bit more about the work and objectives of the commission? Sure. Uh, well, it's been great having you lead the work of the commission, Laura. And and yeah, can we just say thank you, Laura? That's for right. All the work that That's you right. did. I know this is not scripted, <laughs> but thank you, Laura has been amazing in this work. That's exactly thank right. You. Sorry. No, no, you're exactly right. And you know, with the commission, we've been able to bring together folks from across sectors. So we've got phenomenal education leaders like Randy. We've got leaders from the state level, the district level. We've got elected officials. I co-chaired the commission with Chrissy Todd Whitman, who was governor of New Jersey and EPA administrator for George W. Bush. Uh, we've got uh, civil rights leaders. Uh, we've got young people who are activists on climate issues and we've got leaders in the environmental community and so that cross-sector community came together spent a year a year plus listening to folks and trying to learn what folks are doing around the country that is working uh, we heard amazing stories from young people from educators from community leaders and then we tried to take that learning and put it into a report that lays out the role the sector can play. And we really tried to, to lay out the report to tackle infrastructure, 100,000 school buildings, 480,000 school buses, 2 million acres of land, 7 billion meals a year. So there's tremendous work that can happen around infrastructure. But then we also lay out the educational work that can happen around uh, curriculum and instruction in K through 12, around career and technical education and preparing young people for green jobs. We lay out the resilience work that schools can be a part of. You think about schools that can be hubs for folks to get a way to charge their phones when the, when the power is out because of climate disasters. And so there's a role for schools to play in resilience. And then we talk about the equity issues that Randy so powerfully framed. There's no question that climate and, and environmental injustice disproportionately affect low-income communities, communities of color, and schools can be intentional about advancing environmental justice. Great, thank you. So as you mentioned, um, the commission went on a listening tour over the course of the year, and we heard from fantastic people across, across the country, including Maya here. Um, but Randy and Secretary King, um, can you each share maybe one or two major takeaways that you had from what you heard from folks on the ground? And Randy, we'll start with you. So I wanted to make sure I have my notes here about these two amazing students from Salt Lake City. Their names were Andy Matson and Mahidur Tad Tadisi. And they organized a campaign to get the Salt Lake City School District to commit to transitioning to 100% clean energy by 2030. The Salt Lake City, Utah School District. This is not, a, a, I, I use that example because, and, and this is part of what I thought was so impressive about both the secretary and the governor um, co-chairing this committee. We need to get the issue of climate out of an ideological lens. This is a lens for, future, for how we have a world that is sustainable in the future. 
And so what these two young people did is they did what good organizers do. They formed a committee, they plotted actions, they lobbied the school board, they eventually got the board to pass their, their resolution unanimously. And so it was these kind of steps that John was talking about, that Maya does, that others do, to take something and make the organizing real and connecting it um, in a real way. Um, and the second piece I would say is, this was not um, an issue with the commission, but Salt, um, Staten Island, New York, um, the Kathleen Grimm School, young people in an area in Staten Island that you that is pretty conservative, and they are in a completely um, carbon neutral school. And um, we visited that school, a bunch of us visited that school this past, um, I think spring, late spring, and we had a meeting with the young people, um, elementary and middle, and they were talking about in such impressive, real, inspiring ways, not only about recycling, but how they have brought home why this school is important to them and why we need to have others like that. Yeah, so many powerful conversations. Definitely have to shout out Maya for, for being a powerful voice uh, with the commission. Uh, look, one of the most striking, I'll start with the one that, that maybe was most searing, which was hearing from a school board member in Santa Barbara, California, who ran on a climate action platform. And her honest assessment was nobody was really paying attention to her. You know, she was the one at the meeting who would say, wait, we're buying school buses? Shouldn't, shouldn't we get electric school buses? Wait, we're building a new building? Should, shouldn't there be solar panels? And no one would pay attention. And then there was a drought, and then there was flooding, and then there were mudslides. And sadly, huge disruption of the community, loss of life. And then everyone was paying attention. And she was able then with that board to commit to a, a plan for climate action and a plan for the role the schools can play in community resilience. And what was so searing about that testimony was the risk that that's where we're headed as a country, that we're going to ignore this until the disasters are everywhere around us. And as Randy described, we're already seeing them. But we're going to ignore this until the disasters are so severe and then take action. And that was searing for, for me and gave, I think, all of us a sense of tremendous urgency around the commission's work to say, we can't wait. We need to act now on climate. The other, the other powerful story I think of is a, a teacher from Oklahoma who was a little bit nervous teaching about climate action in her classroom, particularly given the role that fossil fuels play in the Oklahoma economy, but found that talking with her students and their families about the land and the role of the earth in people's day-to-day -day lives helped create a bridge to say this, this, isn't a, this isn't a fight about industries. This is a fight for our earth and human beings' relationship to the earth. And she was able in her classroom to really get students engaged with thinking about both the consequences of climate change and what they can do as a community to address it. Yeah, thank you both so much for sharing that because I think what's really remarkable is actually in starting this work was hearing about the amazing thing that the things that are going on across the country and how people really are working locally right now to take action. Um, so Maya, one of the questions I had for you is, you know, the commission highlighted how schools can take climate action in a bunch of different ways and thinking about mitigation in the footprint of schools, thinking about building resilience, thinking about approaches to teaching and learning. How do you think students will benefit from taking a comprehensive approach to climate action in schools? Right. Well, I, I think like everyone has kind of been saying about the urgency of this issue, um, you know, we really just don't have the time to take a, a single pronged approach to, to climate action. Like it's not enough to, you know, as Secretary King said, just teach the next generation about this issue um, without kind of modeling what addressing it actually looks like. You know, we, we don't have the time for schools to not be green. Like they, they have to go hand in hand. Um, I think something that uh, is really important to me 
um, like at Student Voice, we often try to think about not just like kind of student outcomes in school, but student experiences in school. Um, and I think it can be really isolating for students when they're, you know, seeing the UN reports, like we have 10 years to act on this issue. Um, when they're seeing, you know, the mudslides and, and droughts and fire and, and hurricane in their community. Um, and yet, when they go to school, like this issue is just not acknowledged. I think it can feel a little disorienting to like, hear from, from so many directions, like this is so urgent, this is the issue of our generation, the issue of our lifetimes, and then go to school and then not see anything actionable kind of addressing um, th this huge issue. Um, and so I think it's really important for students to see like when they go into the school building, like, oh, adults in my life care about this. You know, the teachers that I look up to and I'm spending like the vast majority of, of every day with, um, you know, care about this issue too. Uh, you know, the way school lunches are run in my school um, takes into account this issue. The way my school is powered, the way I get to school takes into account this issue that everyone is telling me is, is so important to like kind of all of our livelihoods. Um, and so I think that kind of multifaceted approach of um, teaching about climate change and climate action in meaningful ways in the classroom, but then also pairing that with schools kind of physically and materially addressing climate change is really important just so that students don't feel isolated in what seems to be this huge issue, but then isn't really showing up in their day-to-day -day lives in, in kind of action-oriented ways. Yeah, so what I'm hearing a lot from each of you is the urgency of us addressing this issue, but one of the things that I frequently get asked um, multiple times is why now? You know, we have schools going through the pandemic Educators are dealing a lot with COVID in particular, dealing with political debates at school board meetings. Why should the education sector kind of care about this issue now and take action? And Randy, I'd love to get you to tackle this question. So um, I think the secretary actually kind of nailed it when he said, you know, we're, what is now happening is that these climate crises are coming with increased frequency. Um, I think I remember a statistic from the summer that a third of the nation this summer was had been impacted by one of these climate crises. So how do you not do it now? The, the real question becomes, um, how do you do in a capitalist democracy, the alignment so that there's real progress on policy. Um, there was a book that Malcolm Gladwell did a long time ago called The Tipping Point. And one of the things that's so important about all these local levels is that there, and I see this with the question, I'm gonna to get to this answer, there's a tipping point. You also need people in power who want to try to create that alignment and you need activists who um, actually um, are out there making the case. But as every educator knows, from any classes that we've ever taught, you need two things. You need to meet people where they are, and it's not what's said, it's what's heard. And so what I think is going on now in a way that didn't happen before is that there is an alignment in terms of education and the economy and the urgency because people have seen the impact. And so, of course, we, have, we are, as educators, we're kind of like the stickiness that puts it together. We're the explainers. So we're not just, Maya's the activists, but we have to be the explainers about why this is important for the future. Just like people understand, oh, you need to read, that's important for your future. We need to be able to explain it in a way that is understandable, real, relevant. And that's what I think is going on. I'll, I'll end with this story. I was sitting in a meeting on Saturday. I was next to the president of the United Auto Workers, Ray Curry. And we have a meeting in the next couple of weeks about electric buses and about what we can do together about how we can make sure there's more and more and more electric buses. That's an alignment of jobs, 
economy, schools, climate, urgency. Yeah, and it's so impactful, I think, that you mentioned the idea of this tipping point, because actually one of the things that research has shown is that um, in order to reach the goals that we need to reach to decarbonize our society by 2050, education is actually an underutilized tipping point at exactly. this point. And exactly. so actually thinking about mobilizing the sector can really help our broader societal goals that we need to achieve. Pretty soon it will be banned. Don't worry about it. I'm teasing. Um, so Secretary King, um, you know, as we seek to have the education sector address climate change, what do you see as the intersections, and I know you've hinted at this a little bit, but the intersections with racial and social justice in this work, and how, as we're advancing climate action in schools, can we also use this as a moment to advance equity? Yeah. Well, look, we, we have to start by acknowledging we have a history as a country of environmental injustice, environmental racism, and <laughs> We see that impact every day. You know, I live in Maryland and Baltimore. We have some of the worst air quality in the country. There are kids missing school today because of asthma due to air pollution, which has disproportionately impacted low income communities and communities of color. So if we're going to get this right, we need to invest resources in the communities that have historically been most negatively impacted. So if we're going to replace asphalt uh, lots with green spaces, we should start in the schools or in the communities that are most at risk. The schools that are most at risk of heat islands where kids are going to end up missing school because it's too hot in the building. Those are the places we should start with green space and trees, right? When we think about uh, preparing young people for green jobs, we should start those career and technical education programs in the communities that have been most negatively impacted by environmental injustice so that young people in those communities have access to that economic opportunity. And we should partner with the community colleges and the HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities that we've underinvested in as a country for too long because those institutions are access points for communities of color and low-income communities. So we have to be intentional, I think, in our, in our policy response, and we have to be honest about who's bearing the brunt of the consequences of the choices we've made. Yeah, and I think this question is just so central to the work that we have ahead. I think Maya or Randy, do you have anything that you'd wanna add about the opportunity to use this as a leverage point for advancing equity too? You first. Yeah. Well, no, I definitely do agree with everything that Secretary King said. I think, um, you know, just realizing, uh, yeah, who, who's borne the brunt of, of uh, climate change thus far and, and who will continue to bear that, um, bear the brunt of that um, moving forward if, if nothing is done, um, really just like illuminates, I think, like the absolute need to invest in the communities that, that have felt um, the impact most terribly. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think, you know, climate change is often framed as a crisis, which it absolutely is, um, and don't want to understate that at all. But I think it also is an opportunity um, to, like, really think about how education can speak to students' lived experience, how, um, you know, the, the vast, you know, amount of jobs that will be created, you know, kind of as we seek to decarbonize our society. And so... I think, um, you know, who we afford the opportunity to kind of engage in these, you know, new jobs um, is, is a massive, uh, you know, kind of um, consideration with equity and uh, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be an afterthought. For sure. mm -hmm. So this is, um, there's an amazing moment right now um, because one can couple crisis, aspiration, and opportunity at the same time. And, and Maya and John just said this, take the amount, so I wanna throw something out that obviously is happening right now as well, but take something out, um, something from the number of green new jobs that can happen um, in solar paneling, in thermal, in all sorts of other kinds of energy. Um, revisiting wind farms, things like that. All of these require tremendous technical skills 
that are highly compensatable. And if we back map to high school and junior high school using HBCUs, community colleges, and apprenticeship programs. And so there are pathways that young people can choose in terms of, of this work. So we couple the how to solve with economic opportunities and be intentional about where we put those economic opportunities. And, and that's something that we can do. Um, you know, Miguel Cardona can do this. Um, Marty Walsh can do this. Le the, Secret the Secretary of Commerce can do this. There's money for this. There's a willingness to do that. So I think that that, that kind of alignment is something that we can do now, which is really important. But the other piece, and obviously, you know, I think about this every day. I think, how, how can you not, given what's happening in Ukraine? There's going to be a conversation in the next few weeks about, you know, not using Russian oil. There's going to be conversation about the huge increase of prices at the gas pump. There's going to be these conversations around the country. And this is going to be an opportunity to help solve these issues about how do we limit our reliance on fossil fuel. Notice I didn't say end our reliance, but how do we limit our reliance and how do we make this a conversation about the future and patriotism, patriotism all rolled up in one. So thinking a little bit now about teaching and learning in the classroom, Maya, there was a 2019 Washington Post poll that said 57% of teenagers said climate change makes them feel afraid but only 14% said they have learned a lot about reducing the effects of climate change in school. Can you share with us a little bit about your experience um, learning about climate change in school and what you would like to see happen more for students across the country? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I didn't learn about climate change in a formal way, like in, the, in a classroom until I was in high school. Um, and even then it was kind of in classes I'd opted into. I have to shout out Mr. Short, my AP bio biology teacher and my AP environmental science teacher, um, cause he, you know, absolutely integrated climate change into the classroom in a way that felt very real and in a way that felt very, um, I don't know, grounded. I felt that like the more I learned about it, the more equipped I was to kind of address it. It, it wasn't something where the more I learned about it, the more afraid I was. In fact, I think like the absence of it in the classroom was more frightening because, you know, like, like I said, referencing that earlier disconnect between, you know, what students see in their day-to-day uh, -day lives, what students see on the news and on social media and what they're experiencing in the classroom. I think it can be really frightening to feel like, oh, if we don't do something dramatically differently, by 2030, um, you know, the world as I know it is going to be, you know, on fire and in floods. Um, and yet when I go to school every day, like it's not even discussed. I think, you know, oftentimes one of young people's first complaints about school will be like, the things I learn in the classroom don't feel relevant to my day-to-day -day life. Like, wh why does this matter? And I think, you know, this presents like a, an incredible opportunity to really tie young people's education to the, the most pressing issues of our time and kind of equip them with the tools to think about these things productively and, and think about solutions rather than just kind of this, this vague fear of the unknown, this, this danger that isn't, is there but isn't really named. Um, and so I, I always think too with, with this issue to my little sister who's six and a half years younger than me, um, 12 going on 13, um, or no, 13 going on 14, she's about to go into high school. Um, and, and she's been concerned with climate change for, for years um, and has been even like a massive inspiration to me on this issue. Um, you know, I drove her to her first uh, climate protest and yet um, it, she, you know, she, the way she learned about this was conversations with me, conversations with family members, YouTube videos. So young people are finding ways to learn about climate change um, and, and are caring deeply about this issue. And, and yet in her, second grade, third grade, fourth grade classroom, like it, it's, I think, thought that maybe kids that age can't handle it, but they're handling the hurricane evacuations, you know, by necessity, they're, they're handling the, the wildfire evacuations. And so I think it's naive to think that kids just don't know about this if it's not discussed in the classroom. I think it's a contributor to eco-anxiety for kids to not learn about it in a way that's framed 
uh, in a way that gives them agency um, and makes them feel like this is an issue they can act on. This is an issue they can pursue as they, you know, kind of navigate their educational options and, and think about what they want to do after, you know, secondary school. Um, and so I think I, I had a great experience, you know, later on in high school learning about climate change. Um, but that, that's too late, um, I think, to, to begin the conversation. And, and then secondly, just also want to name that I think there are ways to talk about climate change that are can be very tied to specific communities and kind of local things. You know, it doesn't always have to be this conversation of, you know, uh, this is what CO2 is is doing in the atmosphere and this is what the greenhouse effect is and, and this is what air pollution is and these are, you know, the five main air pollutants that you should know. All of that information I think is, is really important, but I think you can also frame it in much simpler ways of, you know, like I know like you, you couldn't go to school today because uh, the roads were flooded. And, and w why is that? And, and what can we do about it? What is the city doing about it? You know, what do you think the city should do about it? You know, who, who's making these decisions? You know, wh what do we think they should know about your experience and how this is impacting you? And so I think there's a way to really frame it in the lived experiences and day to day lives of young people um, in ways that don't have to be like global and, and overwhelming necessarily. Yeah, and it's really important, I think, what you said, because people will frequently say, well, we can't teach kids about this because it's too scary. But actually, you can empower students with knowledge and empower them to learn about solutions to help Absolutely. reduce that anxiety of what they're seeing around them. So we're really fortunate that we have two amazing education leaders here who also started their careers as social studies teachers. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of people talk about climate change and they say it's something that's taught in science classes. Uh, but one of the things that we talked a lot about with the commission's work is actually teaching this across the curriculum. So I'd love um, Secretary King and then Randy to reflect on why um, you all think that climate change should be taught across the curriculum, especially as social studies teachers. Sure. Well, look, there are a lot of social studies implications of climate change. You think about the flow of climate refugees that we're going to see, sadly, around the planet. We're already seeing within the country. There are folks who had to relocate because of Katrina, folks who had to relocate because of Hurricane Maria. Right, so so that's, a, that's a social studies issue. There's the economics of climate change, the move to renewable energy, the decline of fossil fuels, the economic implications that will have. Those are social studies questions. There's the political question. How will we organize at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level? How will we organize ourselves to deal with the consequences of climate change and to move towards a net zero future? Uh, those are social studies questions. So there's an opportunity to make sure that students have the knowledge. You know, how does a bill become a law? How does government work? Uh, to make sure they have the skills. If I want to write a letter to my congressman, how do I write a persuasive letter? If I'm going to testify at a hearing or testify in front of a commission, what does that look like? How do I build those skills? And then there's the application and the opportunity for students to be involved in their school, in their district, in changing policies. As we heard from the Salt Lake City students, but students all over the country, they're the ones who are pushing their school district to move to electric buses, to put solar panels on, to compost. And so there's a real chance for applied learning in social studies as well. I think you just heard my, so everything that John just said is absolutely right. I'm, you know, ticking off. How would I do a lesson right now about Russian oil, for example, or mm. Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees, or, um, but I think what Maya said about three minutes ago, was the kind of civics agency lesson, which is how do you bring an issue that's really important to bear and kids have agency on solving it? And, and that agency requires engagement, participation, and trust. The real issue here is we are in a battle right now about what we teach and media literacy and the role of disinformation. And I think that um, the more I've been thinking about this, what we do in social studies is, yes, 
we teach the difference between facts and fiction or facts and misinformation. And we have actually, as the AFT, just bought this, this product NewsGuard for every single one of our members so that they have a literacy nutrition label about what is fact and what is fiction on media sources. And they will now have it um, for free. But the, the, the real issue for all of us now is how do we empower and engage our students so that they are comfortable and confident with how to think. And, and, and a lot of these, if you recall, a lot of the bans initially were about evolution and about science and the debate and the issues about science now. So I would actually encourage the social studies teachers in the room or listening to find ways to make any climate issue a current event or um, issue right now and find ways to actually teach about it. There will be pushback in different states but if we do not actually make teach about it, then the scariness about it is going to scare people. And the way to stop scaring people and engaging people is to teach about it so that kids feel comfortable and confident about how they solve things. Yeah. So in thinking about empowering and engaging students, you know, students probably have the most at stake with the climate issue and, the, and where they're looking for their future. And they're the major constituents in education itself. <laughs> um, so Maya, I'd love to ask you, how do we make sure that students have a seat in the table and that we work to empower them in advancing solutions in what educators and school leaders are doing? And how do we do it in such a way that the adults meaningfully include students and not just think about them as tokenizing participants in the conversation. Right, well, yeah, definitely at Student Voice, we believe students are like this massive undertapped kind of resource in, in educational discussions um, because, you know, they're, they're experiencing school in a way that no one else is. And, you know, firsthand, you know, seeing the opportunities and the challenges, the things they like and don't like. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, first things first, like just taking that kind of experience uh, seriously and you know, treating that as the expertise it is, I think students uh, are could, can be a great partner in kind of pointing to, you know, I would love to learn about climate action here, you know, I would love for this lesson plan to be connected to like things I can actually do. Um, and so I think uh, first and foremost, just listening to students and, and taking them seriously, treating them as, as partners and equals in this conversation and, and not necessarily just, you know, kind of this like population to make decisions for um, is, is really key. I think listening to all sorts of students across the spectrum is also a really important thing. So not treating students as, you know, I guess not not treating the issue as you have to earn your spot at the table. And then if you're a student body president and you're an honor, a honor student, then, you know, we'll listen to what you have to say on this issue. But thinking about students uh, whose schools like historically haven't served um, and like, you know, tying it back to that that equity issue of um, really prioritizing like a vast array of student experiences um, to understand, you know, the, the ways in which education is kind of failing to tackle this issue and the ways the opportunities education has to kind of address it moving forward, I think is really important. Um, you know, kind of in, inviting students in, not just in kind of consulting roles to these like kind of action, climate action plans that the commission lays out, but really inviting them as, as partners with decision-making power and real influence and sway over, you know, what kind of what happens in their school building, what happens in their district, their city, their state their country, their world, you know, um, I think is, is also really important. Um, and, and yeah, students not just necessarily like, I, I think the commission models this well of students not necessarily just like testifying and sharing their experiences, but young people being on the commission itself and kind of guiding, um, you know, what what decisions get made and, and having input in, in what voices get listened to and prioritized is, is really key. So it, it goes to like that, that process. Um, of, of not just what decisions get made, but, but how they get made. 
Yeah, so thinking about all the stakeholders in education, there's students and then talking about um, educators. Randy, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, educators will be essential leaders and partners in taking climate action in schools as well. What do you think educators can do right now and what support do educators need to be able to do this work? <laughs> um, well, we need a minute or two without a new variant <laughs> and to actually try to, um, and I, you know, I say this half teasing, but in, in all seriousness, um, we need to create safe, welcoming environments. And when I say safe, I'm not just talking about physically safe. Although in the aftermath of COVID, thinking about, and I started by talking about the Cross Bronx Expressway, thinking about ventilation systems and how important they are, not just to make sure that the um, heat works in the winter in Baltimore and there is actually air conditioning in the summer and you don't have the reverse of that, but thinking about how um, an environment in schools is physically conducive to teaching and learning. Those are, those are things that can actually be sized and done as part of just school reconstruction. But the second piece is this piece that we've all been talking about a lot, which is the latitude to teach and to explore and to engage and to do the alignment and the intersectionality of that you can actually solve that flood in South Carolina if there are policy things that we do. And how, and what teaching and learning is, is about a lot, and which is part of the reason why so many teachers, including myself, love project-based learning and the time to do that, is that you have to connect the dots in a real way. And, and so teachers, you know, so, so the easy answer is to say, yes, the state standard should include some climate chapters that we teach on. But it is the really getting to the nub of how students and educators and parents and communities use teaching and learning as a way of helping to solve problems. And one of the major problems that we have is how we actually have an earth that is sustainable in the future. So Randy was getting at this a little bit with policymakers and thinking about the role of policymakers. Secretary King, Portland Public Schools just last week passed a really ambitious um, resolution in their school district to both transition to clean renewable energy and support teaching and learning in schools. Um, what do you think policymakers can do at the local, state, and federal level to really accelerate this work? Yeah. Well, and this is really what we tried to capture in the report from the commission is to say, we hope that every local community will develop a climate action plan that teachers, parents, students will be key partners in developing those climate action plans and figuring out what can we do at the district level to, again, address infrastructure, address teaching and learning to try to advance climate action. My hope is that states and the federal government will step up as a support. And there are a number of ways that that needs to happen. For example, there are a lot of school districts that would love to get to all electric buses, but it's expensive and they need help with the financing model so that they're able to pay to, to get the electric bus now and then make the money back over time as their energy costs are lower. That's a role the state can play. In many cases, states are a key driver of school construction funding for building new schools, funding for school renovation. It's crazy that we would build a new school today that's fossil fuels reliant. We'd literally be digging our own hole deeper. So states should be leading with their investment. The federal government, hopefully, is going to put a lot more resources towards climate action if Congress uh, can find a way forward. And some of those resources should be targeted to the K-12 sector. But the other thing I'd add 
and I know Randy would feel this way too, is we also have to just do a better job supporting and investing in public education at the federal and state level so that people don't feel overwhelmed every day. Exactly. Right? I, I was talking to a school counselor the other day who has, she's assigned to 700 students. How could one school counselor support 700 students and families? So if you said to her, hey, by the way, we'd also like you to work on this climate action project in your school, I can understand why that would feel overwhelming and unfair and wrong. And so we've got to make sure that we're, that we're delivering not only on climate, but on a broader vision of strong, safe, supportive schools. And how you align the accountability system to that. So that there's not an accountability system that says, just focus on math and English test scores when we're all trying to do this instead. So it's not just the investment, but you have to align the accountability system to what is it that kids should know and be able to do and actually let us have the time and the resources to do it. So one of the things, and, and I'm gonna have two kind of lightning round questions for you left. Um, you know, one of the things that gets asked a lot is, is uh, what do we need to take this to scale? So I'd like to ask you that in particular, both what do you think we'll need to take this to scale? And what are you doing individually to advance that scale? Um, so I'd like to start with Secretary King, then Randy, and then Maya. Look, we need a collective sense of urgency. So part of the work is narrative building, right? Saying the education sector can be a part of climate solutions. Uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish with the commission. I'm trying in my work as an education leader, but also in my work as a community leader in Maryland to, to make that case. Um, and we need, I think all of us, and I'm trying to do this, to push our state legislatures, our members of Congress, the federal government, to really take this on and deploy all of our resources um, to make climate action uh, and education a standard conversation, not, not something that's surprising or unusual, but actually something that we're constantly thinking about together. So look, I, I suggested this a little bit earlier. We're gonna have this conversation in the United States in the next few weeks over the course of gas prices and what happens here. And what does that mean in terms of fossil fuels? And what does that mean in terms of our reliance on fossil fuels? And I think that this creates an opportunity to have a different conversation in terms of the future. Um, and so I kind of believe in go where, where people are and start that conversation in a different kind of way. And I think we should think through um, maybe with the task force how to start that conversation. Um, the second thing is, I, I actually think that there is, and I said this earlier, there's, you're seeing with the infrastructure bill and with the um, focus on getting lead out of pipes in schools, um, the uh, electric buses, uh, and some other pieces of that bill. If we actually start aligning economic interests to the work that's getting funded right now and, 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 and see a future in, the, in, in um, reducing the carbon footprint, I think that alignment is gonna be very, very powerful and will be what helps us actually have a more effective conversation than we're having right now. Anonymous said something like, you know, do you believe the attendance in this room matches your experience with the rate of engagement? I think what happens is that if people are not deeply involved or engaged, or if you are not under the age of 25, there is a disengagement about this issue because it feels so big it feels like, oh my God, we can't solve this. And to kind of like what Maya was talking about earlier with the Salt Lake kids have done other things, we need to size it so that people see it's possible to have an effect. Yeah, uh, I think uh, 
just kind of going back to um, that sense of agency, uh, I think a massive way to, to scale this is just to create an environment in schools um, and just like kind of in our society in general where young people feel like if they care about this issue, there are ways they can act on it. Um, I think, you know, in my kind of, you know, work working with students, I can see a real shift from like when I first start working with them, like it's kind of like, OK, yeah, we care about this, but nothing's going to get done. Like no one's really listening to us. Um, you know, what, what's the point in, you know, putting a bunch of time and energy into trying to do something if we're just going to be shot down, if no one's taking us seriously? And I think kind of shifting you know, how decision making works, you know, at, at, from the local level to the federal level so that, you know, the communities most impacted by this and the young people's mo most impacted by this feel like they, they're going to be heard, you know, if they try to take action will do go a long way because it, it's definitely not an issue of young people caring. Um, you know, I think every conversation I have with classmates, with peers, with family members, with you know, the young people I work with in through student voice, like young people care. And so I think it's about building schools and building school boards and building, um, you know, kind of legislatures and building a uh, federal uh, government that like listens to those young people and, and works with them. Um, we'll do, we'll, you know, scale up uh, climate action tremendously. So with one final question and very quick lightning round, you know, the UN just came out with another report indicating our window to address climate change is rapidly closing. But there's still room for hope. And I'd like to ask each of you all just in closing very quickly to share what makes you hopeful. So we'll start with Maya, then Secretary King, and then Randy. Yeah, I, I think echoing the sentiment I just shared, I think the young people I work with and know and, you know, go to school with and um, are, are absolutely an inspiration to me and, and are hopeful to me on this issue. I'll name Nora, my little sister, maybe is the number one. <laughs> uh, I think about our commission visit to a net zero school in Virginia. <laughs> and Randy asked the question, uh, how much more did it cost to make this a net zero school? And the response was, didn't cost any more. It's about the same as building a school that was fossil fuels reliant. And as you walked around the school, what you saw was kids who are excited about being in a net zero school and have a real understanding of what the solar panels are doing, have a real understanding of the ways in which their school is contributing to solving this problem. And you can be confident those are kids who are going home and saying, hey, how come we don't have an electric car? Hey, how come we don't have solar panels on our house? And so that kind of positive momentum that you could see in that net zero school, that gives me hope. Um, I think just like John and Maya said, I think it's our students that give me hope. The students in Staten Island, the students at that school in, um, in Arlington. Um, I've been in 97 schools since last April and our students are our future and they give me a lot of hope every time I see them. So I just want to take a minute to say thank you all so much. Thank you for your leadership on this issue and being out there. And let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you both.